Welcome back, everyone. I'm over here at work, and I want to show you a problem that some of you might be experiencing with the Monoprice 3D printers. These are the Monoprice Mini. I think it's the Mini. Um, it's a very inexpensive and very popular printer, and I have to say, for what it costs new, it's not a bad purchase. Um, we've had actually tremendous luck with these units. We have about five of them. And um, this particular area uses these a lot. They use this printer a lot in this room. And um, I mean, almost it's always running. It's constantly running. We haven't had one head failure. We haven't really had any issues other than the initial setup and adjustment. Because they're so inexpensive, quality control at the factory isn't that great. So you're going to have some issues out of the box with adjust, adjusting uh, certain elements. Um, I have one example, the uh, element feed lug here um, usually comes from the box bent. But this one, ooh, this is a newer version. This is a newer revision. Uh, but some of them are, this this little, um, little socket is mounted on a piece of steel. I'll show you one that's done that way. And that piece of steel tends to get bent in, in shipping, and it doesn't line up, and you got to bend it back. But that's not a big deal. But this one, the entire feed assembly is one solid block of looks like fiber reinforced plastic. It's not bad. But the problem with these machines is partly to do to, uh, to do with the heated bed. Um, so this is not an enclosed printer, so it does have a heated bed. Um, it usually maintains about 50 degrees Celsius. And uh, that is critical for layer adhesion or um, bed plate adhesion, um, especially with the first couple of uh, couple of layers. Um, but the problem is not the bed plate itself, but the wiring that feeds it. So if you look underneath the bed plate, between the bed plate and the traverse, there are two sets of wires. There's an 18 gauge, and I believe it's a 22 or 26 gauge wire. The thicker 18 gauge wire provides power to the heating element and the other two thinner 22 gauge wires are for the feedback signal. There's a thermistor embedded into the bed plate and that's how it maintains temperature. It feeds it, reports back what the temperature is and it regulates that way. So what happens here is See those wires right there? Now this is one, I don't believe this one's been fixed or it hasn't had this issue yet. But this wire, this, this little bundle of cables here, two th I, I've seen a few things happen to them. Uh, one thing that can happen is that zip tie right there can get stuck on the bearing block and cause it to jam. That has happened before. The other thing that can happen is the wiring can rub up against the bearing block itself and short out. Now I'll show you a unit that has had this happen and it's, it can be catastrophic. So what can happen is a couple of things. Number one, if the two wires, the two, um, and not only that, but they, they, they also wear out um, from fatigue. So you can have a fatigue failure where the wire breaks internally. So that there's a lot of different ways that this design can go bad. Um, if you're getting a 999 temperature reading, um, that can happen if the uh, thermistor uh, harness gets shorted out. Um, if the, or opens up completely, I forget which way it goes. A thermistor is, uh, it, it's like a resistor that changes in value as the heat goes up or down. And that's how it can measure the heat of the bed plate. In one case, I had one where the um, both wires on the heating element side, the two 18 gauge wires, shorted out against the bearing block, and that caused a 999 reading on the th on the temperature. So, um, I have a, a solution for this. I mean, look at look at how poorly designed that that harness really is. I mean, it just it's it's in the way. It should not have been there in the first place. But I have a solution for that that will permanently fix it um, as long as the uh, heating element power amplifier uh, does not burn out. If it does, then you've got to fix that first. But um, 
Let's get this thing plugged back in. I'm gonna show you what I'm gonna do. This one looks to be in pretty good shape. I know that one of these printers, one of the two that sits here normally was sent out for repair. It was either this one or the other one. And it came back, I'm pretty sure it was the other one because it came back with a, with a, a plastic mesh over that harness. And that's the one that failed catastrophically. Let's take a look at it. Okay, so here is the one that I fixed. It's uh, running happy, actually really nicely. Um, I just got finished adjusting the bed plate, calibrating it, and uh, running a test print after my repair. Before I show you what the repair looks like, let me show you what happened to it. So this is that same wiring harness you saw on the other printer. This one had a mesh around it, which was supposed to be the fix. So this actually has broken twice, if I'm not mistaken. Um, the first time it was fixed under warranty, the second time I'm like, screw this, I'm going to come up with a better idea. This is it. So these are the two 18 gauge wires, and they shorted out against the bearing block. You can see little burn marks. Um, but it, it severed the entire cable. <laughs> it's pretty bad. The, um, there were some other spots, I, I believe, where the, uh, the uh, thermistor wires were also damaged. And I'm not seeing that here. But yeah, that's what happened to it. And I was getting a 999 temperature. So 999 degrees Celsius uh, was the reading. Um, apparently that can happen if, uh, see, I thought that could only happen if the thermistor wires were damaged, but apparently I'm wrong. But okay, let's take a look at what I did to fix this problem for good. Now, I'm not printing anything of value here, so I don't care if it gets screwed up. Let's take a, take a walk in the back here. You can see what my solution is. Um, what I did is I bought a roll of um, eight conductor ribbon cable, 18 gauge. Um, so we, we've basically bumped up the thermistor signal wires to 18 gauge. It shouldn't affect anything. But um, I routed the cable out the back and gave it a nice curve so that there's, there are no pinch points. There are no areas of any concentrated stress. And as long as nobody really tries to grab it by the cable, it should be okay. Now the cable is secured to the bed plate using the original solder points and I took some epoxy. This is what I used. This is Loctite Instant Mix Epoxy. This stuff is fantastic. You can just basically squeeze it out wherever you want it to go and it's pre-mixed and ready to, to, to harden. So that should um, provide some strain relief between the cable and the bed plate thus protecting the, uh, the solder connection. So of course, if this gets ripped off the bed plate, well, it's game over, dude. Um, as for the underside, as for the underside, I cut, using a Dremel tool, I cut a nice notch right where I needed it to be so that the cable can exit the back of the machine unimpeded. I also rounded off the cuts with a grinding stone so there are no sharp metal points there either. Probably should put some kind of a rubber um, insulator around that. Um, but I, I don't think there's it's really necessary. There's no, because on the inside here, I used a catamount type um, mounting block and a zip tie secure the cable so that it can't be moved around at all. So that is my fix for this printer and as you can clearly see it's printing all happy and not giving any complaints. I'm getting accurate readings. Here's my platform temperature 48 or 45 target and 194 out of 195 on the extruder. Running at 1.0. Can I change it? I've never tried changing the print speed. Let's see if we can speed it up. I wonder how that's going to work out for us. Forget it, bring it back to one. Can I change the set point? I guess I can. Look at that, I can change the set point live. 
Okay. Probably not a good idea if you're already printing because you could <laughs> have some problems there. But anyway, I just uh, wanted to kind of go over that. Now these printers, like like I said earlier, these have been remarkably reliable. Um, with the exception of that bed plate wire, that was the only major failure I found. But as I was saying earlier, um, this one is a different version. This is an older one, I believe, or an older revision, where the um, the uh, filament feed tube is mounted to a steel tab. And uh, this one was no exception. This one actually came out of the box bent, so I had to straighten that out. It's one of those machines, if you want to get into 3D printing, just as a, just to practice as a hobby, I mean, under 200 bucks, and you've got a machine that will use any filament you want. It'll use ABS. Uh, we're using PLA. Um, it comes with a possibly illegal copy of Cura, or I, I don't remember which, which, um, yeah. I, I think it comes with Cura, with Cura and it's, it's, dodgy license wise. I don't know how legitimate it is, but um, it's straight out of China, so God only knows. Um, yeah, your um, slicing program is, uh, I think it's Cure that it uses. But um, I actually don't remember what they're using right now. I think they're using uh, Tinkercad to design, and, uh, and it's able to be used with this machine, so. Well, that's it for now. Thank you for watching my video. Oh yeah, this thing is a bad fan. That rear fan, it, it makes a lot of noise on startup, but it quiets down once you start getting it rolling. Probably have to pop in a new fan. But the good thing about that is it's just a standard 20mm um, fan in there. I think I might even have one to pop in. So. See that there's no more cable to be pinched under that bearing block. Nice, nice. All right. Repair probably cost about 10 bucks. Um, I bought a, upon an entire roll of cable. I only needed about a foot. But there we go. So funny, guys. <clears throat> I decided to improve the uh, quality of that strain relief little bit. I'm going to be using some of that lovely epoxy that I love so much. I'm going to build this up just a little bit. Just to uh, improve durability a little bit. Remember, this is the only thing protecting that uh, precious uh, solder pads, uh, the four solder pads underneath. You want as little uh, flexing of this cable as humanly possible um, in relation to the plate. And this is basically as good as liquid plastic, so I'm just gonna carry that over to the top of the bed plate just a little bit. We do not want to put anything to chance. It's not pretty, but this isn't really a pretty machine anyway, so no love lost. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my Dremel once this hardens, and I'm going to kind of make it look pretty. Er. Stuff takes about a little while to set up. And uh, once it does, it's fantastic. Plastic fantastic. Just build it up. And then uh, let it cure. But yeah, this is wax paper. So that should peel off pretty nicely when done. We're not, we're not leaving anything to chance. Okay, so here is the finished strain relief that I crafted out of epoxy. 
I ground it with my Dremel tool to be a nice, as close to a normal shape as I can get. Um, I'm gonna have to, of course, you know, recalibrate the bed plate height, but that's okay. I only have to do this once. But I feel confident that that kind of a strain relief will prevent any further wear and tear on the bed plate and prevent the cable from detaching. So that's, that's all that matters, really. So let's test out our new strain relief. Let's just make sure we still have plenty of nice, clean travel here. Oh yeah, that'll do. And the top of the strain relief um, casting, if you will, uh, is outside of the printable area. That's important for obvious reasons. But that should take care of any bending and flexing without putting any strain on the underside of the of the uh, build plate. Because the underside of the build plate, which is what this cable is attached to, um, is basically silk screened in place. You know, uh, if any tearing were to occur of the uh, solder pads, it would be devastating. You would need a whole new build plate. So we're almost up to the 50 degree set point. I'm going to begin by homing the uh, print head. Oh yeah, let me tell you about another defect we found. One of the machines we ordered, the uh, limit switch wasn't working. <laughs> so the head would come crashing and press down on the build plate, bending the build plate in the process. Yes, that happened. We RMA the unit for a defective limit switch. So just uh, FYI, right, how are we doing on our temps? Not bad. Pretty close to the 40, uh, 50 degree set point. You want to have the set point or the, the, the temperature up there because um, to compensate for any changes in the metal print head or build plate in terms of size. So we're going to get it up to temperature. We're going to wait for the whole 50 degrees. So before I got rudely interrupted by a coworker, I was going to go through the um, calibration procedure. So what you've got to do is shut the unit. Uh, you first home the uh, print head and uh, traverse build plate. Then you've got to um, shut the unit off. Now what you want to do is position the print head above the build plate on the build surface. Then you take a card. This works just fine, and we're going to use the um, just one one half the thickness of the folded card. So you know what I mean, just like that. And then you can slide it between the nozzle and the build surface, and you're looking for just a little bit of resistance. Then you're going to position the nozzle over the other side. Again, check for resistance. See, we have a little bit less resistance on this side than we do on this side. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna make a tiny adjustment. We're gonna raise the build plate up a little bit by turning this screw anti-clockwise. And position the card again. I feel no resistance at all. So once again. Now this should be done with the build plate heated. Let's see, a little bit of resistance. Okay, and let's check it again, the other side. All right, so that should be only done with the build plate heated up. little bit of resistance but not enough so I'm gonna raise the head or raise the build plate up just a tad and do that one more time 
time. It's easier to do this with two hands, but I'm filming, so. That should do it. And over here. A little too much, so I'm gonna lower it by turning the screw clockwise. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. A little will do. A little more. That's perfect. Now that is a calibrated build plate. This baby is ready to print some stuff. And I just went through my parts bin. Turns out I have a whole bunch of these Nidec fans. 20 millimeter size. So we're going to throw a new fan in this one. <clears throat> because it really needs it badly. Notice that they used a very, very cheap little tiny thin little fan. Um, we need to make sure that this is going to fit. We're going to dry fit this first before we put that in. Okay, so looks to me like it fits, and there's a little bit of room between the fan and the connector block on the board, so it should be okay. Just want to make sure that nothing um, <clears throat> is able to hit. So I'm going to have to drag these cables over a little bit. You can see that these are the cables that go to my new um, build plate wiring harness. And what I did is I actually soldered them in onto the original pins on these plugs. It worked out pretty nicely, actually. So let's go ahead and put a new uh, pigtail on this. Warm up my soldering iron. We'll get that going. I'll be able to wire in the new fan. And a quick side note, you want to make sure that when you're splicing wires and things that you pay attention to what you're doing because that ain't going to work. Yeah, I actually did that. Boy oh boy. Alright, here we go. We're going to turn it back on again. Got the new fan. I'm going to preheat it. And then once it reaches a certain set point, that fan will kick in. Hopefully. There it goes. Oh, that sounds beautiful. Much faster fan than what was in there, but hey, it works. I think that came out of a server. Whoa. Well, at least there's nothing wrong with it. So I'm going to show you two more printers. This one's actually running a job for me right now. This is a DaVinci Junior. This is uh, primarily geared towards the educational market and consumers. It's a very low cost, easy to use, very predictable, good quality machine, but it uses DRM spools. They have a chip inside each spool that identifies the, uh, the filament spool and it uses that information to track how much filament is used and how much remains. Um, the whole purpose of that is so that you have to buy your filament from DaVinci or XYZ printing and uh, not many people like that uh, because you only have you can only use whatever they will sell you 
And if they decide they don't want to sell filament for a particular model printer, you have to now buy a whole new printer. Um, they can also charge whatever they want for the filament. And they often charge a little bit more than what you pay for, say, a roll of Hatchbox, which is a generic universal uh, filament. The Da Vinci Junior sells for around 300 or 350 or somewhere around there. I forget what we paid for these. We bought a bunch of these, about probably three or four of them. And uh, we've had great luck with them. They're reliable. I haven't had a single issue with any of these. Um, but like I said, you're limited to just what they'll sell you. And I didn't make the decision as to what to buy. My job is to support, set them up, and make them work. But um, again, these are a breeze to set up. You are limited to using um, XYZ's own um, slicing software, but you can print a standard STL file once you run it through their slicing program. Um, and when you open the door, the light comes on. It should come on. Oh, you know what? It only comes on at the beginning of the print rather than after the pairing. These printers can be purchased with a lot of different options. Um, they offer a laser cutter or laser engraver as an option. Um, there's a couple of different um, head or nozzle types. You can get a hardened steel or the basic brass. A hardened steel nozzle is more durable and is more compatible with the metallic, uh, slightly abrasive filaments. Now, if you like the idea of the build quality of one of these, and it looks really nice, uh, but you don't want to use DRM spools, you can either hack the system, which people have done with success, or you can spend a little bit more money, about $100 more, and get the DaVinci Junior Pro. The DaVinci Junior Pro has the same uh, spool loading mechanism on the side internally, um, but it will also accept standard off-the-shelf uh, hatchbox rules through the back. There's a, a port on the back and you just get yourself a spool stand and it will run whatever you want. So that is an option. And like I said, um, just like the Da Vinci's, they also offer the engraver module which replaces your, um, your nozzle. Um, for a little extra money, you can also get the same hardened steel uh, nozzles with that one as well. But, um, you know, we're talking about 3D printers under $500 here. So you're not going to get, you know, the best of both worlds. You're going to get you know, something that will do the job. But again, I believe this one also works. Uh, yeah, this one will also work with, um, I think it works with Cura as a slicing program as well as... Uh, Da Vinci's own, or XYZ's own um, slicing tool. Um, but again, I like the build quality of the XYZ's, I just don't like the, uh, all the gotchas, like you have to use their slicing program, you have to use their filament. Um, but, you know, for a, a predictable, out of the box, ready to go experience for the price, I, I don't think there's anything better under $500.